anti-immigrant racist basically party is the second strongest. This is, I think, I cannot judge about you, but definitely in Western Europe and somewhere else also, I think, the greatest danger. We are approaching an era where, if I may paraphrase Sigmund Freud, who spoke about, in German, Unbehagen in der Kultur, discontent, uneasy, unease in civilization, uh, about uneasiness, discontent with liberal capitalism. The tragedy of the Western Europe is that, and not only of the Western Europe, is that the only organized large political force which successfully gives voice to this discontent are fundamentalist racist nationalists. And it's an incredibly sad phenomenon. How, so again, how to break out of all this? It is, I think we should start at the very beginning. It is a standard thing to say how uh, uh, how 1989 meant the end of utopias. The utopias are over, now we reached maturity, we see capitalism is the only thing which really functions. But I think nonetheless that uh, if there is a meaning to the first decade of the 21st century is that this utopia, Fukuyama utopia of the 90s is dying, died twice. I think that precisely the two events which limit the first decade, September 11 attacks and then uh, at the end financial crisis. September 11 attacks mean, if they mean anything, I don't think they were such a big event, but if they mean anything, they mean a sign that liberal democracy is not a forum which can simply be applied to the entire world. And the financial crisis means second death of the more economic aspect of liberal capitalism. Uh, so uh, uh, my point is that we may all laugh about Fukuyama, end of history, but again, as I already said, you know, secretly even the large majority of our left is Fukuyamaist today. Nobody even talks today about you know, the problems we were talking 30, 40 years ago. Is capitalism here to stay or will there be another society? Is the state here to stay? Can we, it is as if these basic things are here to stay. Even as my friend, American Marxist Frederick Jameson pointed out, referring to all these catastrophic films to 2012 and so on, it is for us today much, much easier to imagine the end of the world as the end of capitalism, you know. Okay, an asteroid will hit us, some virus, we are all dead, but somehow capitalism will go on. You cannot even imagine a change, a change of uh, capitalism. So Perfect. Okay. So let me go on. According to Gerald Cohen, in classical Marxism, working class is characterized by first, the fact that it constitutes the majority of a society. Point two, it produces the wealth of society. Point three, it consists of the exploited members of society. And point four, its members are the needy, poor, needy people, parts of society. 
and then from these four features, two further features follow. The working class has nothing to lose from the revolution and it can and will engage in a revolutionary transformation of society. But there is a point in Cohen's observation that today we still have a majority, we still have exploitation, we still have poor, but they no longer, even in the long term, belong to the same group of people. Those who work, workers, are usually not the poorest. Even those who are the poorest are not always those who, those who protest, those who rebel, and so on, and so on. So, uh, what does this mean? That it simply disturbed, confused the field? This brings me to the crucial question, which is, I think, the question we all face today. Uh, uh, is capitalism here to stay? Which means, will it be possible for capitalism to, even if it's a little bit transformed, to contain, at least, if not resolve, its contradictions, antagonisms, or are we facing today problems, antagonisms, which will prevent the indefinite production, reproduction of capitalism? Of course, I will not cover all these problems. There are many, many problems. For example, deep things can be said about the so-called moral vacuum of that the global capitalism is creating. Deep things can be said about how the so-called capitalist permissivity is misleading, that how contemporary capitalism involves new forms of domination. What do I mean by this? Just to amuse you a little bit, let me give you a brief anecdote that I like to repeat. We have traditional paternal authority. And we like to say today how the authority is no longer paternal, it's more permissive. But permissivity can have its own traps, like, again, my own story from when I was young. Let's say you have a, an authoritarian father. It's Saturday or Sunday afternoon, father tells you, we have to visit grandmother. I know she's old, boring, but you have to do it, behave properly, obey. No problem. You will do it, you will rebel, it goes. Let's say you have a postmodern permissive father. What will he tell you? He will tell you something like, you know how your grandmother loves you, but nonetheless you should visit her only if you want to visit her. What's the trick here? The trick is that apparently the father is giving you freedom of choice. But, you know, every child, and they are not stupid, knows that beneath this freedom there is even a much stronger order. The order is not just visit your grandmother, but you must like to visit your grandmother. <laughs> it's a much harsher order. I think this is one of the great tricks of, of permissivity today. The problem, another problem, people praise sexual liberation. That's why we have depressions and so on. Because at least in the West, friends are telling me who are psychoanalysts that uh, People no longer feel guilty today for having perverse desires and then you go to a psychoanalyst who liberates you and you can enjoy it. No, people today feel guilty for not being, for, how should I put it, for not being able to perform, for not being able to act. People feel guilty for not enjoying, the big guilt if you cannot sexually enjoy. So the idea is that the psychoanalyst should return you to enjoyment. The paradox is what? The paradox is that it is precisely, and that's one of the lessons of psychoanalysis, this shift from permitted sexual pleasures to ordered sexual pleasures, which causes depressions, impotence, frigidity, whatever, whatever you want. The worst thing your father can tell you is to tell you, why don't you seduce girls, where are you, be a man, and so on and so on. Okay, but these are other amusing stories. Let's stop with this and let's go to four absolutely serious, crucial problems, which, as I see, generate also what we should still call proletarian position, although not quite in the same sense as Marx. So, four spheres which I think generate problems which cannot be solved within liberal capitalist framework. First, of course, ecology. 
On the one hand, one should emphasize the infinite adaptability of capitalism. Capitalism is able to turn every crisis in a new source of investment and profits. If, if half of the United States go underwater, they will open up a new market for reconstructing whatever and so on and so on. And up to a point, it works. Like you can tax pollution and so on. The problem is that when we are dealing with the threat of large cata you know, if you have a small valley polluted, you can do it through market means, because markets work through competition, trial, and error. But when you have Chernobyl of global warning, you cannot say, we will try this way, if this doesn't work, we will try another way, and the market will decide. We will all be dead before the market decides. It is why. 